One of the things about Prince that I think really makes him stand out is that he's one of those artists who he's incredibly talented at guitar and vocals. You'll have a lot of yeah. artists who are really good singers and they're they're so-so guitarists or vice versa. He had both. If you had to say, was he better at vocals or guitar? I know it's a tough question, but if you had to pick one, what would you pick? I, 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 I you know, I couldn't answer it. Yeah. I, I'd have to say he was better at both, you know. <laughs> uh, shoot, you should hear the guy sit down on a piano. Hmm. You should hear him play the freaking flute. You should hear him play the drums. I mean, it just... He's he was a genius all the way around. See, uh, and every instrument that he touched, I don't know what would, he was from a different planet <laughs> because his brain. Uh, he just I, I I personally I've always said this. I don't tell nobody, but you know I don't care anymore. Um, I, I personally think he had that Asperger's syndrome, Asperger, or mm, whatever they call Asperger, something like that. Yeah. Man, he he was there was some autism there. Man, that dude was just unbelievable. He was like the Rain Man, you know, mm. in the casino counting cards. I mean, he he heard and saw things in a way none of us could see, you know. And so, I mean, that that's just a borderline genius and crazy at the same time. I mean, and, and he had both of it. The <laughs> prince was crazy. Don't let nobody fool you. Prince was crazy. <laughs> but in a good way. <laughs> what he does is when he gets in the studio by himself is he comes out of body. I, I heard him. I heard him do it. He comes out of body, all that screaming and squealing. and <laughs> You know, I mean, he comes way out of body and he really feels what he's doing. And then he's got take after take after take. And he pick the good ones. He'll start bouncing some things, and voila! At the end, you got a great song with f full of feel, just feelings. You, it's coming from the depth of his soul. I learned a lot about writing from him because that's how he does it. That's... Don't worry about making mistakes. Get the song done, and then go back and fix all that little stuff. So if I may ask then on that note, would you guys, I mean, if he discloses, would you guys ever go back and edit his vocal takes or would it usually be just the, the straight take that he did? We never knew what he did. I mean, I'm telling you, I've heard uh, so many different versions of the same thing. And uh, but he was notorious at editing, you know, um, he would go in and he would, like I said, he'll get the feel once the feel is there. Like, that's why we would do it live all the time. You can't get a better feel than doing it live. Hmm. And then you take that multi-track, you go in the studio, and then you put that, the, the finishing touches on it. He'd he go in his private little space and kick everybody out, and then he would do his thing in there for hours. And uh, dude never slept. But um, And then the finished version was full of just feeling and attitude and everything that it needed that he didn't capture live. It's made it better. So when he would record his vocals, would he, I guess then, from your experience, would he always do it by himself or would he sometimes have an engineer or a producer with him? Um, I, You know, I wasn't there because, you know, I always got kicked out. But the, the bottom line is, um, I don't think he let anybody in the room with him when he recorded. Every time that I've been in the studio with Prince and he's doing vocals, he's by himself, you know, and he makes everybody get out. If he has a question, you know, the, the engineers are right at his fingertips. But for the most part, what I believe is that he would do it all by himself. I know that, uh, like I said, we would do it live, but he would always go back and edit it because he would do some stuff in the studio. I'd be like, he didn't do that on stage. Mm. You know, he didn't do that at rehearsal. He added that. And he was notorious for that. But that's what made him so, he, he was a genius. I mean, the way he would put things together. And so that's what made him so unique. A, a, a lot of people I hear talk about Prince and his vocals in the studio, but here's the real truth. None of us really know. Okay. And I'll give you an example. Some of us know to a degree, but we don't really know because we're not in there. Uh, when he does vocals, he brings that microphone right here and, uh, you know, he just, he, he, 
you know, he's got the control controller here and, and, and all the faders and everything. And then he starts singing. He's sitting down. He's singing at the console. And he'll lay like a scratch vocal. But like with anything, he don't care what it sounds like. You know, it could be he could hit flat notes, sharp notes. He did not care. It was getting the feel down. Hmm. The one thing I learned about Prince and, and the revolution learned from Prince is it's all about the feel. Get the feel. Don't worry about the mistakes. We can always go back and edit those, but we need to get the feel. So he would go in the studio and he would get the feel. Like, for instance, when I, I wrote the music to Kiss, uh, a lot of people don't realize that. Um, and, and he took it. He was like, ah, oh, I love this. <laughs> he brought it in. The, we were at Sunset Sound. He brought it into his studio and he said, uh, uh, you going to dinner? I said, I'm going to dinner. I'll be back. He said, OK, I, I'm just going to work on it a little bit. So when we got back, I, he called me in the room and I'm in there and he let me hear it. I was like, dang it. I said, you, 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 you're going to take this, ain't you? I said, well, you know, it, it's going to be better for us. And I'm like, us? Who's us? He said, the revolution. You know, I was like, OK, so, so you're saying that we got, you know, we're going to do a cold thing together. I'm finally going to get to write a song with Prince, you know, by myself, you know. But anyway, long story short. Uh, he was working on the vocals, uh, the the main vocals, and um, he was punching himself in. But then he was like, "So um, I'm gonna get to work, Mark. Uh, so um, you can leave." <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, uh, "I'm like, okay, so okay, that means get out. Okay, you know, all right, do your thing." So, I mean, you mentioned right now that you've never seen him doing the vocals in studio. So this was the same for all the records you worked on with him? Yeah, Purple Rain, Round the World of the Day, um, and Parade. And Sign of the Times. Like I said, we were about a year and a half, two years in front all the time. He was always way ahead of himself. So Purple Rain wasn't even finished, and he was already on Around the World of the Day. So that's just how he was. By the time Parade was finished, we were already working on Sign of the Times. So right now we were just talking about his vocals in particular. What about yeah. when he's recording his guitars? Would it be similar where he'd like to be by himself in the studio or was that different? See, the guitars, he would do that live. When we were, we'd be in the warehouse and we'd be recording, tapes always rolling. We'd go over the songs a hundred times. So he'd have, he'd have many different takes of the same thing. Mm. Um, but then, like I said, editing, he'd get in that studio and he, once he hears and feels the energy coming back live, now he knows what he wants to do to it. And so he would grab it and add things like, for instance, there's a part in the long play version of uh, Let's Go Crazy. Uh, it goes. Da -da 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 None of us could play that live. We was all stumbling. You know, we sound like, I, I love the way Wendy put it. She said, if you isolate these tracks, it sounds like somebody that fell down the steps. <laughs> and, and that's exactly what it, it, it sound like. But when it's all together, it's like, whoa, this is working. But it, it was something new. And, and so we weren't, we didn't perfect it, but the feel was there. Hmm. See? So once we got the feel of what it was supposed to feel like, and Prince would go into the studio, and I I know I got the multi tracks, I got all the breakdowns. That's sick. and I'm li and I'm listening to, it and I'm like, ah, he edited that because I hear the guitar and it's perfect. I'm like, it wasn't perfect when we did it. <laughs> perfect on the tape, and it's because he'd go in and he would edit, and that's what he did. He was notorious for it. That's, that's actually really interesting. So, I mean, yeah. a lot of artists, they double their guitar tracks, they double their vocals. Do you know if Prince would double his guitar tracks and vocals? Well, he really didn't need to. I mean, he always had Wendy. Before Wendy, he had Des. I mean, and then even later on, it was Wendy and Miko. I mean, so uh, Prince is a phenomenal guitar player, but he Wendy plays different from Prince. So he liked that. You know, because that's what made it, it, it gave it, it gave the song what it needed, the feel. Uh, that's her personality. Mm -hmm. And so he would just, uh, she would usually play a chord and then he would play a chord on top of that chord. Mm -hmm. And everything was always orchestrated. If you ever isolate left and right, uh, Wendy and Prince, it's it's amazing. Mm -hmm. the, the syncopation between the two doing totally different things, 
but in such a unique uh, fashion. Even when, if you ever broke down the keyboard, same thing. Lisa and Matt, they always play two-handed. He dared you to play one-handed. You had one hand resting, he'd probably throw a shoe at you. <laughs> you know, you always had to be playing two-handed. If you isolate the tracks and listen to them together, it's like some Mozart stuff, you know? That's cool. It's like from Beethoven, and it's like, dang! You don't realize all that's going on in the track. It's so simplistic, yet it sounds so complicated, mm -hmm. you know? One thing I want to ask you before I forget, why, I mean, this may have been documented, but I'd like to hear it from you. Why did Prince like the color purple so much? Purple royalty, you know, I mean, mm. purple was always, you know, even in biblical times, it was a sign of, you know, this really elite mm. or upper crest, you know, royalty. And, and I just think he was just into very into old history and and like i remember when we all went to see mozart i mean this dude sat up in that theater i was like he rented the whole theater out and had we could bring friends and stuff and he he was digging that movie that's i cool. think he saw himself in mozart i really do that's really cool mm, and he was just real eccentric eccentric yeah very very and so, and it showed, I mean, we, it's like, we never knew what he was going to come up with next. Come walking in there. I remember he came in there, the collar was this big. The collar was all the way up here. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. I was like, man, what, what kind of shirt is that? He said, you like it? <laughs> you <want one? laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> you want one? You know, I'm going to take you up to see Mary Beth, you know. And we'd go up there and he'd say, oh, damn, Mark wants a shirt like this. I mean, you know, the collar. I was like, no, bring the collar down to here at least, you know. Yeah. That, that was Prince. I mean, he, he got into Elvis, the Beatles, and you could always tell his transition by what he would wear. That's actually so cool. Where he was going on the next album. I was like, okay, it's going to be a Beatles album. It's going to, you know, around the world in a day, it's going to be like the Beatles, Yellow Submarine. I said, here we go. How did you hear the, the news of his passing? How did, how did that come to your attention? I mean, you know, I, my... I've always been involved with the security over at Paisley. Um, you know, my friends were heavily in the security. So I always knew what was going on from a security standpoint. So I got a phone call nine, it was about nine o'clock in the morning, seven o'clock, Minneapolis time. And my friend, uh, he goes, he said, Mark, something, something's wrong. Something's wrong. I said, what do you mean something's wrong? Something's wrong at Paisley. I don't know what it is, but something's wrong. I mean, all the cops are out there and everything. And, you know, one of our security guys, name is Mike. He, he was an ex, ex cop. And so he called and, and he had said, you know, Hey, there's all the police are out here and blah, blah, blah. So, um, <clears throat> he calls me, he said, I'm gonna call you back. Call me back about 30 minutes later. He said, Mark Prince is dead. And I remember I just sat there in silence. I said, what are, you, what, what are you talking about? He said, Prince is dead. They found him uh, in, in the elevator, just, uh, outside the elevator, just laying on the floor. I was just like, oh, no. And I remember the tears just came running down my face um, because me and him had unresolved issues. Yeah. See, you know how they say, you should always tell somebody you love them because you never know when you're going to see them again, see? And I never got that opportunity. You know, he was like my brother, man. He was like my big brother. He was mean to me, but he was like a big brother to me. So that was really hard for me when I heard of his death and I didn't get to resolve our differences. That hurt me. And so, um, yeah, uh, I was on a plane the next day. Uh, yeah, the next couple of days I was on a plane to Minneapolis. Within the community, like the revolution community, the people that knew him, I, I guess you guys all had to kind of band together to get through this situation. It must have been hard on all of you. Yeah, because, you know, there was always this fighting, you know, always this tension. And I never understood it. And even with Sheila, you know, it's like me and Sheila, we, me and Sheila was friends. We was cool. So I didn't understand why the revolution we kind of got pushed in the back. We showed we didn't even get invited to the funeral. We weren't we weren't there. 
We didn't get invited. We weren't there. We weren't invited inside of Paisley. Nothing. We were insulted, you know, um, because we helped build that freaking building. You know what I mean? Paisley Park was a result of all of our hard work, you know, and and, and you you ain't even going to invite us to his little funeral uh, ceremony. I mean, it's like, what are you, what's wrong with, what's wrong with you guys? And so for a couple of years, we went through that tension, mm. you know, with, with the rest of the bands from Paisley. And it's just, yeah, it's sad, sad thing. I knew something was wrong. I just didn't know what. Very private guy. Uh, he would not tell me. Um, I wasn't close enough to him at that time for him to tell me what what's going on in his life, what he's going through. But I did. I did hear uh, the rumor was he had had some li- uh, hip surgery and that he was on pain medication. Mm. So I was always wondering. I'm wondering if you know maybe. A lot of people get addicted to pain medicine, especially fentanyl. And I was like, I'm wondering if that's what's going on. Because his memory was just shot. You know, couldn't remember that I was his bass player. He flies me out there. This is the second time, only to leave me sitting in a hotel room for three days. You know, everything was just off. And I knew something was wrong. And then the next time that uh, we spoke again, we talked about the revolution getting back together. You know, I remember I talked to him about that and he said, why? I said, what do you mean? Why? I said, it was the biggest thing in your, in your freaking history. That's why I said (laughs) purple rain was the biggest. He goes, yeah, that's true. And I said, your fans would love it. I said, can you imagine? We just do a 10, 15 city world tour. I said that just 15, you know, two weeks. I said, you will sell out stadiums, bro. I said, it's going to, it will be massive. I said, you should do it. He looks at me and he goes, well, we'd have to give all the money away. I said, Mm -hmm. said, what? He said, we'd have to give all the money away. He says, you know, we can't do it for the money. And I said, well, well, what? So you think we're going to do it for free? And he says, well, well, you know, we'd have to give it away to charity. You know, we can't take from the fans like that. And I said, charity begins at home, Prince. And that was my last conversation with him. I remember, I'll, I'll never forget. I, charity begins at home. We were your family. We were the closest people to you. We helped you build this empire. And you're going to look at me and say, oh, the only way you would do it is we give the money away to charity. And then he goes, um, I'll think about it. And that, that was my last conversation with him. The next thing I know, you know, he passed away about a year and a half later, wow. some, something like that. Given the huge success of Purple Rain, was there any more, like, was the feeling in the studio different post Purple Rain? Like, was there more pressure or did you guys not think about that too much? I didn't think about that too much. Not for me. Hmm. Uh, it was real easy for me. Uh, he said he liked my style at that point. I had developed this this mean rumble on stage, you know, or the bass would just be like, you know, cool. and it, it, as long as you give me that, I don't care. I don't care what you do. I uh, remember we would play like a life could be so nice, you know, <laughs> you know, you don't know what the bass is playing. Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. it's just rumbling, but everything else, <laughs> and the feel is there. See? And, and uh, once we had that feel, Everything else just stacked right on top of it. Purple Rain is considered by many as one of the greatest records ever made. During the yeah. making of that record, did you guys feel something special was being done, or did its success surprise you? The movie surprised me. I, I can't speak for the rest of them, but for me, the movie surprised me. I thought it was going to fail. I was like, mm. this is whack. This movie stupid, you know. And so I never liked it. I never thought it was going to work. And I, I was surprised. But the album, I always felt we were on this trajectory. Trajectory. We were going like this. You know, we were controversy. Uh, 1999. 
No, nah, I was like, we right here. I said, this album is going to go in the stratosphere. I, I knew it. I just had this feeling that that record right there was going to blow up. And I remember that was the first time he started calling us the revolution. And so that's the first time that, because uh, Dez had quit, and that's the very first time we had full input on that album. You know, contrary to common belief, we all wrote that album. See, mm. a lot of people don't want to give us that credit, but, you know, we were fully engulfed with that record. I mean, fully engulfed, you know? And so I I knew just by the way stuff was evolving, I was like, this is going to be the jam. This album was going to hit. I just, I knew it. So the cool. movie, I thought the movie sucked. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, when you guys were, as you were saying, you guys all, as a band and Prince, you guys all had a very important input into the creation of Purple Rain. So what exactly was the creative process like during the making of that album? It was very interesting because, again, Prince is treading new territory now. He He's allowing himself to be in a band. Prince has never been in a band since Grand Central, you mm-hmm. know, with Andre and uh, Morrison. He's in a band. And he wanted us to look at that way. I'm the band leader. This is a band, Prince and the Revolution. So everything evolved. So, for instance, uh, let's go crazy. You know, that's the feel he wanted, that swing, right? Mm -hmm. He didn't know where to go with it. It was just like he's looking for this swing. Bobby, and it evolved. See, we would rehearse and rehearse i call it practice he get mad when i say that but we practice and practice and practice until we it started to evolve and then next thing you know started taking more of a swing more of a rock kind of you know it was just heavy and uh and as it evolved you know i evolved i started rumbling more using distortion pedals i mean things just started to change because we had freedom. He never told me what to do. He never, uh, in 1999, controversy, yeah, he told me what to do all the time, you know. This was the first time he did not tell me what to do. He wanted my input. And I was like, ooh, I'm gonna put everything I got into this band, because this is going straight to the top. And I knew it. And so um, the creative process there was, everybody kind of had the same sentiment I had, and everyone put everything that they got into that record. And it's as it started to evolve, man, it just started getting cooler and cooler. And then we do these test gigs at First Avenue where we'd go play. And then he would test it. And then we were always, he I don't care where we went, he had tapes rolling. He was always recording. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. And so a lot of people say, <clears throat> you know, do you remember when you guys recorded Purple Round? I was like, I mean, which time? <laughs> he probably recorded it a hundred times, you know, and then bounced it down to, you know, one track. I mean, uh, you know, one reel. But, you know, we've recorded that song over and over and over and over and over again. We played it so much, I it became who we were. Heck, I could play Purple Rain in REM sleep. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, you know, it just became who we were, and that whole album became a, 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 a part of who we were as people, personalities. So cool. So, I mean, you know, you just mentioned now that you guys have played that song so many times, even during the making of the record, you guys played it in different variations so many times. Do you yeah. remember then the actual studio recording that you guys did at Sunset Recorders? Oh, um, no, I don't. Um, because for me, it was nothing significant. Hmm. And I only remember things that were very significant. Gotcha. We played that song so much that I could never pinpoint where a particular version came from. And I hear a lot of engineers get on and, you know, interviews. And I'm like, come on, <laughs> come on, guys. You know, stop trying to take credit for stuff you don't know nothing about. Prince was a very unique individual and he did things in a very unique way. You can't car- uh, compartmentalize that. There's no way, you know, uh, that stuff came from many different places. He could have 
a hundred bass lines from the same song for all I knew, you know, because he was always recording. So, um, and, and I don't know how much you know about uh, putting together multi tracks, but you yeah. can bounce, you can take stuff from a different version and you can move stuff around. He was an excellent editor. Mm-hmm. And so it, that's just the way we work though. I was mimicking Prince. I had my own band Maserati. So I was mimicking him. I had a band on the side I was producing. And so, uh, I would get to rehearsal early because all the equipment's there. And I would start writing songs mm-hmm. and he would walk in and he'd be like, what's that? Like, Dang it. You know, cause I knew the minute he said, what's that? It's gone. He's going to take it, you know, and ask me, can he have it later? Uh, so like a song like girls and boys, you know, mm-hmm. I'm jamming on that. Just bass and drums. He comes in, takes it, you know, as the band walks in, he's like, hey, 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 uh, 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 get on the keys and do do something like this. I mean, so he's, he would direct it, but all of our creative input is what made it what it was, see? So to say that uh, he was the sole creator, no, that's just not true. See, people don't understand. We all created that music. That's why it's so different from the other records. You listen prior to the revolution and post-revolution, Sign of the Times, because Sign of the Times, a lot of that was us. Mm. But, you know, after Sign of the Times, you hear a, a significant difference in the way that music sounds. And that's because Prince went back to being a solo artist after we left. Mm. And he just put a band behind him and he said, Prince and the MPG. Interesting. You know, he, asked, he asked me to be an MPG, but it's it's like I didn't want to be in a, a I didn't want to be a backup. Because that's what I would have been. Gotcha. So I guess my question to that would be, you know, why did Prince firstly, when Purple Rain, he turned more into, I guess, more of a collaborative artist? And then why did he eventually go back to being more of a solo oriented artist? I mean, everybody's got their theories. I can tell you mine. And it's just my theory. I quit. I, I left the band after Purple Rain. I only reason I stuck around is because we did a private contract outside of the band hmm. you know prince had prn had a private contract with me uh, and i i was going to stay till after the parade album that last gig in yokohama stadium japan that was my last show and that was all i knew that prince knew that nobody else knew it he swore me to secrecy i couldn't tell anybody that i quit so that was one of the deals of the the, the contract that i had and so I think that from that point on, do I rebuild or do I just go back to what I was? Hmm. And that's where MPG came from, Steve. And last, you know, because I had heard that he was having issues with some of the other members. And next thing I know, you know, he just let everybody go. He said, I'm done. Hmm. uh, I had heard about that through the grapevine. I was not there anymore. And me and him were still on talking, speaking terms, though. So, because uh, I, I had Maserati and, and he was interested in them. And I also, when Paisley Park was complete, he would send me a lot of the overflow, okay. my studio. He would send the work down to my studio. So I was still involved with Prince on a great level. So I think what happened was when, uh, after I quit, you know, things started to fall apart. Hmm. dismantle and you know I, in my book i really talk a lot about that because um you know there were there were very detailed reasons why i made that move and i think instead of rebuilding something like that he just went back to being in full control on what the writing in the creative creative uh direction was going to be in comparison, can you describe what the recording sessions were like for the stuff pre-Purple Rain? Like, what was that like in studio? You guys were, I guess, you weren't really coming up with parts. Prince was telling you what to play. Was that kind of how it was like? Yeah, like, for instance, 1999, okay. uh, I remember he called me up 3 o'clock in the morning, typical. Um, <laughs> you know, and i go drive way out to the boondocks and, you know, he'd be like, hey, I got a hit, man, I got a hit. You know, bah, 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 nah, nah. I was like, Okay. And I was like, that's a hit. You know, 
because I couldn't hear it. It wasn't done. Uh, so he says, okay, I want you to sing. I want you to sing this part. I want you to go, you uh, know, uh, uh, let me see. Yeah. A sky, a sky was all purple. There were people running everywhere. That's what he wanted me to say. Okay. And I sang it. And he go, and he rewound it. And he said, listen back. He said, oh, no, 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 we can't. We can't do that. You sound like me. <laughs> you know, because our voices are too close. You know, I, I, Des has a unique sound. I, I sound like Prince when I sang in that key. And so, but it was all done. You know, I didn't have to do I never picked the bass up on 1999. I mean, it was done. Boom, 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 boom. That's all it was. So, I mean, he could play that. He didn't need me to come all the way down in the studio. But we didn't do it live. We always went to his house. And then it was always finished when I get there. Hmm. So I didn't really have a lot to do. So. I hear you. So, I mean, do you remember the like what the rest of the process was like for making that song, 1999? I just know because I nobody was there. It was me and Prince. And then he would call in Dez. Dez would come in and sing his part. Lisa and uh, Matt would come in and do their thing. It was always separate. Hmm. You know, I, I didn't know what the other guys were doing. It was always separate. Prince was in full control of the creative output of Controversy in 1999. Mm. Totally. He worked a lot with Lisa and Matt. You know, I remember they would always be going out to his house. Interesting. But you were also involved with the music video for that song, right? You appear in the music video for 1999? Yeah. Do you remember the day of the recording of the video, what that was like? I I don't remember. It was just like another day on stage for me. I mean, (laughs) But uh, because we always have videos going uh, in some fashion or another. Mm -hmm. But I I do remember um, he wanted me to wear this black shirt was all cut up. and I was like, like, you know, (laughs) I might as well not wear a shirt, dude. I mean, it's like the way it looked, you know, and I remember I hated the shirt. And he wanted me to wear these purple, silky looking pants with buttons going on. (laughs) <laughs> he said, you know, it's going to be all purple, you know, I want you to. And so he had to make me some purple pants with buttons. And so I remember we were shooting the video and I didn't really have many parts, but it was one of the few videos where I'm in it a lot, which I was shocked. I was like, oh, <laughs> wow, I'm in the video, <laughs> you know, because it's usually always Prince, Dez, Lisa. I was never in the videos, you know, you know, I'll be a spot in the back, you know, in the dark. And so I, that, that was the one thing I remember that was notably different about that video. He was bringing me more forward. I was like, Oh, okay, this is cool. I'll take it. That's awesome, <laughs> man. So what did you think of the video when it came out? I loved it. I, when it was all done, he called me up to come pick me up and, and uh, we both lived in Chanhat. I lived in Eden Prairie. He lived in Chanhat. And he used to always come to my house, pick me up, say, I want you to hear something. He would drive around and um, uh, let me hear the songs. And so I heard 1999 complete. And I was like, whoa. I was like, man, that, that sound way different than it did at the house, you know? Mm. And so he, he, he was just a great producer. He knows how to put that stuff together. But very different experience than with the revolution when we started recording. It was very different. That's really interesting. So this is going to be probably a very silly question. But when the year 1999 actually came around, did you ever play that song like out of irony or anything like that? You know what? I I was I actually was you know hanging out with the 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 in sync posse. Okay. Uh, Cool. uh, Yeah. So I actually was at a. Uh, night, New Year's Eve, nineteen ninety nine. I was at an in uh, sync party, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I, you know, I, me and Prince weren't talking at that time. Hmm. So, but I, I, I did always think it was kind of ironic that <laughs> wow, it's nineteen ninety nine. We did this song way back. So I mean, is there any one Prince song or record you've worked on that is that is particularly special for you? Special in different ways. I loved America. Hmm. America to me was a full expression of the revolution. That was us at the height of what we had become. 
Uh, I remember we debuted that in uh, Nice, France. Okay. Uh, outdoor concert. And I'll just never forget, man. He's like, Mark, what are you wearing? I said, I don't know, but <laughs> I'm wearing it. I, I said, uh, it's, it's a little chilly. I'm thinking about wearing this big old coat. I had this real long coat. He said, yeah, 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 wear the, wear the coat. He said, I'm going to wear a coat too. <laughs> and then so we kind of just uh, uh, totally different. We weren't dressed up or anything, which is odd for us. Hmm. You know, I mean, it was a street coat. I looked like a bum, you know, had my hair coming down like like uh, George Michael and Wham. <laughs> you know, and then I just remember down, 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 and we got out there and, and man, just that boom, 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 boom. the groove was so mean that the audience was just went berserk. The French people went crazy. And that was kind of like our test, uh test for that song. You know, I was like, oh that that's that's the cut right there. That that song sits well with me. There's there's a couple other two. I love Computer Blue. Hmm. Computer Blues just got this the bass. The bass on it's just mean. Kiss, I'm sentimental with Kiss only because I wrote that for Maserati. Your band Maserati. Band, uh, yeah, hmm. and uh, Prince wrote the lyrics though. Prince, okay. you know, genius writer, you know, and he just gave me it on a cassette tape. And it was just his vocal, uh, but in a baritone. He wasn't in the falsetto. And uh, he was playing this, the guitar. Dun, 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 dun. And he said, you know, this will be good for Miles Rye. I said, no, it won't. <laughs> I said, this is whack, man. I said, you, you, you should give this to Bob Dylan or somebody. You know? <laughs> Same for me. You know, and then so he's like, well, just, you know, just try it. And so I, I tried it for all but five minutes. And I said, no, nah, no, hold on. <laughs> and then that's when I started building the song, putting the beat to it and everything. And then when he came in the studio, he's like, what was that? <laughs> he looked real around me and he said, what are y'all getting ready to do? I said, oh, we going to go to dinner. He said, okay. You know, I'm going to take this over to my studio and I'm, I'm going to do some work on it. When, 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 you get, when you get back, you know, just come see me. And he took it. <laughs> I <laughs> thought he was just going to go and add some really cool stuff. Like, the, yeah, that was like classic. You know, he added all that. You know, I just had the groove, you know. Boom, yeah. boom, boom, boom. You know, I had the groove and everything. And he just went in the studio, man. He wore that thing out. I, I, I'll never forget the look on my face when he played it back. I was just like, dang, that's a, that's a hit. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a hit for us. <laughs> we mean for us. Uh, <laughs> it's one of those things where there's so many stories about it. I don't know what's true. Do you know why Prince became a symbol? Like why he did that? It's just my opinion. You know, mm-hmm. uh, me and Prince at that time we were on speaking terms. Okay, but I do know his personality, and uh, I do know that he was uh, really he did not like how the record labels would give you these contracts, lock you up for an extended period of time under a contract, and Prince and Michael Jackson, you know, they they might have been getting, you know, four, maybe five, six bucks an album. See, That's crazy. Yeah. They were doing good, but I mean, yeah. you know, records selling for $18, $19, $20. Yeah. Where's, where's all that money going, you know? And, and so, um, you know, Prince is like, you you give me an advance, I pay that advance back, and 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 then you're only giving me this amount of money from my record sale. I'm selling 15, 20 million records. Now, you do the math, and you, you, you take, you know, their share, 10 bucks or so, <laughs> times 20 million, you know, or 40 million, they're, they're cleaning up. And, you know, and he's, he didn't think that was fair. And um, from what I heard is he tried to go and, and renegotiate some stuff. And, and you know, that's when he just uh, said uh, they owned his name. They owned Prince. So he just started calling himself the symbol because, mm-hmm. you know, they owned Prince but they didn't own the symbol. So same man, different artists. 
is basically it was very clever how he did that. A uh, very bold move. He made his point and he did open the way um, for rethinking how these contracts went down. I came back into Prince's life in 2000. I was living down in Florida. He would call me a lot through the years. Um, late at night, though, he'd call me like, you know, 11, 12 at night. We talked for three, four hours. And, and it's because I could tell um, things were changing. I think he was reevaluating his life and he was reevaluating some of the, the harmful things he did to those who were closest to him. Hmm. You know, I love that he was my brother in the way, but he treated me so badly. And I think he was starting to feel bad about how he treated me. So he was trying to rekindle that friendship that we had. And um, then in 2000, um, he actually asked me to move back to Minneapolis because he wanted to form this new group with John Blackwell myself and Morris Hayes and he wanted it to have that you know kind of that revelation revolution feel to it and I moved back to Minnesota and he forgot that he had me move there really <laughs> no that that's that's heavy see I don't packed up I was a I was a realtor I was working for Caldwell Banker I just started with them and he picked up my entire life and asked me to move back to Minnesota. And then I sit for four months, uh, not knowing what's going on. Didn't pay me nothing. And I knew something was wrong at that point. Hmm. I said, something, something's wrong. How, how do you forget something so drastic? And then uh, he was having this big party. It was in September, I remember. And I remember Takumi calls me up and Takumi uh, says, Mark, he says, uh, oh, you got to get down here, man. The band, we're putting the band together, man. He's putting it, he's putting it together. We're going to start rehearsing. They, they're having this big old party down here, big party tonight. I said, come on down. I went down there. I dressed up and everything. And went down there. Of course, I can get in Paisley. I he, he had like a no entry list, like okay. a lot of band members. He won't let them in Paisley. He had a list. You know, you couldn't get in Paisley. They don't let these people in. I wasn't on that list. So, I mean, thank goodness, you know. Mm -hmm. And I went down there and security just let me right in. And uh, I saw Rhonda, Rhonda Smith, you know, bass player, Rhonda Smith. And um, I was like, and they were on stage filming a video. Like, oh, he must be doing a video or something. Hmm. And she comes up to me afterwards and she said, Bro, Martin. I was like, Hey, Ron, what you, what you doing here? And she goes, Yeah, we can ready to go on tour, you know. So I'm just in town, you know, uh, just doing this video. I'm going to leave and then I'm going to come back and we'll start rehearsals. And I said, Oh. And then he comes running over. He saw me talking to her, man, he panicked and he came running as fast as he could. He says, hey, hey, what's going on? He said, oh, so you know Rhonda? I said, yeah, I know Rhonda. And he goes, he goes, oh, man, you know, are you going to stay and play tonight? And I said, uh, you invite me on stage, I'll play. And he says, okay, yeah, stick around, stick around. And stayed around all night, never called me up on stage called Larry Graham, he called all these other people. He never called me onto the stage. So I was like, what is going on here? And so I just left. I left. And I didn't talk to him for goodness, a couple of years. Mm. A couple of years. See, but I knew something was wrong. You don't you don't do that to people, you know, if you in your right mind. So I knew something was wrong. And then uh, came back again. He was doing the same thing. He said, you know, I will form this group. You know, I want you to audition. He flew me. Now, he he's paying. He's flipping the bill for me to come across town, you know, come across the uh, the country. I'm, I'm sitting in my hotel room day one. Day two. <laughs> I'm like, I don't have a number. Can't get a hold of him. Yeah. So day three, I go down into the lobby and I bump into John Black. I said, John, he said, bro, Mark, he said, what are you doing here, man? I said, 
Prince told me he's forming a group and he wants me to be in it. He goes, does he know you're here? I said, he flew me here. I've been here for three days. Oh, hold on a second. He calls Prince. Prince. Hey, yeah, I'm on my way. I'm on my way to rehearsal. Look, look, Brown Mark's here. And then you could just hear this silence. He said, well, what do you want me to tell him? He, he's, he's standing right next to you? Yeah, he's right here. Okay, okay, bring him, bring him, bring him down. I get in the car with John Blackwell. We go to Paisley Park, and uh, there's uh, Ida, or Ida. I, I, I never get her name right. Hmm. Uh, she's there, and I'm there. He's on a bicycle, you know, riding around the parking lot. And he looks at me, comes up to me, he says, he looks me up and down, and he says, he says, you look good. You look good, man. He says, your aura. He said, I can tell, you know, life's good for you. And I just didn't say nothing to him. And he said, did you bring your guitar? I said, Prince, I don't play guitar. <laughs> I play bass. And then he goes, hmm. You know, I know he's listening to my records because I did a rock album and I played all, you know, the music. And I do play guitar, but I'm not a guitar player. And so I said, look, I play guitar in the studio, but I'm not a guitar player. I'm, I'm the bass player. He goes, well, somebody's got to play guitar. He looks at Ida and says, you going to play guitar? She says, I don't play no guitar. And he goes, well, somebody's got to play guitar. He says, come on. He said, let's, let's go in. We go in there and we start jamming. And it was just the weirdest jam session ever. I couldn't hear anything. And everything was off. It was not like I'm used to. I knew something was wrong. I knew something was wrong. And then when um, everybody left, he, he asked me to stay. And he, I'll never forget it. He uh, had the chef make me some minestrone soup. Hmm. And we sat there and he, he started talking about how he says, I'm very grateful to you. He said, you helped me build this place. You helped me build Paisley. And, you know, Paisley's yours, too. And I said, okay, give me the keys then. <laughs> you know, he looked at me and said, and I was like, well, then it ain't mine. You know, okay, stop saying that. Don't say it's my place, too, and you ain't going to give me the keys. And then, um, so we had a little laugh. And But he goes, I'm going to give you this new album coming out, and I want you to learn all of it. And, you know, we'll... I'll, I'll, we'll call you when we start rehearsal. Say, so I said, well, when do you think that is? He said, a couple weeks. I said, okay, okay. So I went home, flew back home, working my butt off on this album, right? Never calls. Never calls. Next thing I know, there's a group called Third Eye Girl. After that, he passed away. So he, well, he did the piano tour, and then he passed away. I knew something was wrong. I just didn't know what. How did you end up working with Prince? It, it's really funny. I worked in this pancake house, and Prince starts dating uh, Kim Upshur. Oh, okay. Uh, she passed away now, but um, at the time, you know, really good-looking girl. Uh, she was a waitress, and uh, she comes running in the back, and she says, you got to make this special order for me, because I was a cook. Okay. And uh, I was about, you know, 15, 16 years old, you know. And she's like, you got to cook this already. You got to cook it really good. And, and you know, I made him some pancakes. <laughs> so cool. It's the pancake story, you know. And uh, so I put all my special flavors and stuff in it. And, you know, and I'm jumping up and down trying to see what is this? What is she talking about? Why is she so excited? And, and I see this dude sitting out there with this big old afro, light-skinned guy, you know, and looked like nothing I'd ever seen before. He looked like, a, you know, just kind of freaky. You know, I was like, man, what is he, a punk rocker? I mean, what is he? <laughs> but I knew he was cool, whatever he was. Yeah. And I wanted to be like that. And so that was my first encounter with him. And when a few years later in a rehearsal, he goes, I said, Prince, I got to ask you something. I said, do you remember Kim Upshur in the Pancake House? And you came in there and she asked, 
me to make breakfast for you. And he goes, he's, he's thinking, he goes, I, I, I remember that. Cause he, he never came there before. He says, I huh. do remember that. I came to her job. She said there was this, uh, this kid that was just jumping up and down over the counter. Cause he was trying to, you know, he was just acting weird. I said, that was me. <laughs> that was it. We, we hit the floor laughing so hard because he could not believe that was me, you know, and, and, and how life just took that full circle. And that kid that worked in that pancake house is now playing, uh, happens to be a bass player, a known bass player in town working in his band. now. It was just the weirdest thing ever. And we just laughed and we, we talked about how that was meant to be, you know, that's such a great story. So I guess musically, how did you guys connect then? I played in a band called Fantasy. He was to, used to always come to our shows. Okay. But I didn't know. You know, I oh. you know, I had no clue. He would, like, we always, every once in a while, we knew he might have been there because we would see up in the corner. He and Andre used to come in a lot. and But um, I used to see, you know, he had that big old afro. He was hard to miss. Uh, at the time, it, it, was, it was not really Afro. It was kind of poofy, but he was wearing it down in his face. Gotcha, yeah. And so he was, wasn't hard to recognize. And nobody uh, wear their hair like that. And uh, so a couple of times, I, I had saw, seen him in there. And I said, wow. I said, you know, I tell the guys, I, say, I, said, I think Prince is here. <laughs> you know, and I get all nervous. Like, oh. And I said, no, I think that's him. Look up in the corner. You know, look up in the corner. And so that happened quite frequently. I think that's how he got introduced to me in the industry. I heard he auditioned a lot of bass players, but he was very specific in what he wanted. And I think that one of the reasons why he chose me was because I was young um, and he knew that um, I was moldable, you know. Hmm, I got you. He didn't have to worry about me being set in my way, yeah. you know ego and all that. And I was a kid, 19 years old, you know, big head little kid, 18 or 19 when he would come see me. And then so he did his research because he knew nobody knew where we rehearsed hmm. because we weren't supposed to be where we rehearsed. So there was a community center called the Way Community Center. Okay. We rehearsed in the back um, warehouse room after the community center closed at uh, 9 30 at night so nobody knew we was there community center's empty our singer had the keys because he was one of the directors there and so he'd lock the door and boom let us in the back door and That's we'd cool. be back there rehearsing so one day the janitor comes knocking on the door and he goes oh there's a phone call from mark brown everybody drops what they're doing they're looking at me like phone call huh. you tell people we were rehearsing here i said no I don't, nobody knows we rehearse here i said i didn't tell nobody you know everybody's like well who, who could that be and i was like i don't know maybe it's my mom or something maybe they, and i was like wait a minute she don't even know where i rehearse so but anyways i i went up to answer the phone you know and i was like who this you know and he was like this is prince i said Psh. I said, man, whatever, click. I hung up. No, really? <laughs> and I started walking away and the phone rang. And I turned around. And, you know, I was like, should I pick it up? I mean, it's a community center. I shouldn't even be picking the phone up. So I just picked it up. I said, hello? And he said, this is Prince. And so I was just sitting there for a second. I was like, wow, maybe this is really him. And I said, yeah, I said, okay, what's up? He said, is this Mark Brown? I said, it's Mark. Uh, I want you to audition for my band. That's so cool. I was like, oh. <laughs> I was like, well, I, I was speechless. I was absolutely speechless. And I was like, oh, oh. I said, oh. Okay, you know, I had to get my composure. You know, I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to sound like a little sissy, you know. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Well, where, where are we gonna meet? You know, I'm trying to be cool and stuff. <laughs> He's like, okay. Uh, uh, on, on Thursday, it was Tuesday night. He said on Thursday, Bobby Z gonna pick you up uh, at your job. 
I was like, at my job? How do you know where I work? <laughs> what do you mean at my job? You know, he knew where I worked. I worked at 7 Eleven. That was another job. I was a hustler. I had all kinds of yeah, jobs. Yeah, that's cool. And uh, so uh, he said, he don't pick you up at 7 Eleven before your job, uh, before you start work. And I was like, okay. And I hung up the phone, went back to the warehouse. Everybody was like, well, who was that? I didn't want to tell them because I knew it was going to be a fight. I, yeah. I knew they were going to be mad. Long story short, I mean, uh, I told him it was Prince and everybody got mad. It was a big old fight that ensued. And everybody's throwing stuff because they were like, oh, that's it. We might as well just quit. I mean, why are we even doing this? You know, the band's over, you know. Mm. And so I wasn't even going to take my equipment home because I knew if I took my equipment, then they would really know what was up. So I abandoned all my equipment and everything, and I just left. And I had 24 hours to learn three albums. Yeah. I had 24 hours to learn all three of his albums, and I was like, Whew. So anyways, I went in, and I learned to the T. I knew every lick, everything about them. And I walked into that audition. And the interesting thing about the audition is um, – he already hired me and he just didn't tell oh, me. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, I, we're sitting down there, me and Bobby. And he's like, okay. And it was just in his studio and he just had the drum set up and the bass. And, and we were both sitting on the amps. And he said, do you know uh, do you know this song or do you know that song? I'm like, yeah. And do, 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 do. And we, we start playing about 10 seconds later. He said, okay, okay. <laughs> You know, and I'm like, well, we didn't even play it. <laughs> we didn't, even get, we didn't even get to the verse, you know. So we did that for about 15 minutes. And then he goes, okay. Okay, that's good. But anyways, uh, I, I said, it's kind of weird. You know, after 15 minutes, we were only there for 15 minutes. And, you know, we're bouncing through songs. We didn't even play anything. And I think he just wanted to see how I reacted with him. The funny thing is... He goes, Bobby, you can leave. I'm going to drive him home. I was like, ah! <laughs> we get in the car. We get in the car and we're driving. And uh, he says, I want you to hear some stuff. And he starts playing new music off the Controversy album. Okay. I was blown away. I was like, oh, wow. wow this stuff is dope. I was like, you know, and he, he was watching my reaction. And he said, you like it? I said, man, that stuff is, the, that's dope, man. That, that's going to hit. And then I'll never forget, he goes, well, you know, if this record doesn't work for me, you know, I'm going to get dropped off the label. And I was like, dropped off the label? He said, yeah, this is my the end of my contract with Warner Brothers, my last record. If this one doesn't work, you're going to drop me off the label. Mm -hmm. And I just looked at him and I said, dude, this is going to work. I said, out of all the stuff I haven't heard from you, I said, this is going, this is going to blow up. And he said, you think so? And I said, I think so. He said, I, he said, I hope so. And then he starts talking to me about my life. Oh, okay. I'm like, dude, how do you know where I live? I mean, he knew everything about me. So he, he takes me back to my car at 7-Eleven. He says, okay, here's the deal. Job's yours. So cool. And I need you to take uh, uh, through the weekend and you call me on Monday. I was like, Ooh, I'm going to get his number. <laughs> you know, but he says, call me on Monday and you let me know. I said, look, I ain't, I don't even need to think about it. I, I'm, I'm in. He said, no, no, no. I want you to think about it. You, you let it go through the weekend. And I was like, okay, but I'm in. <laughs> he takes off. I go right to the club. I said, oh, I'm going to the club. I'm <laughs> yeah. to tell everybody. And the minute I get through the front door of the, the Fox Trap, I think it was called Fox Trap at the time. And the minute I walked the door, Terry and Jimmy walk up to me. You know, Terry, Terry's like, congratulations. I was like, congratulations for what? They already knew. They already knew he had put me in this band. I, I was already the pick. So I, I just thought it was like, wow, this is so cool. You know, it was mind blowing for me. You know, 19 year old kid, it was mind blowing. That's so cool, man. 
I guess the day after, did it did it click in or was it did it take some time for you to kind of click in that this just happened? No, for me, because this is this was my energy. You know, this is what I've been waiting for. I mean, I worked hard on my base style. I worked hard on my image, my look, everything about me. So I had been waiting for this, a break. Mm -hmm. I've been waiting for a break. Um, I knew a record company was going to spot me because I was one of these guys in town that stood out. I was different. Mm -hmm. And, and that's what they look for. So I, I kind of always had a positive view of my future in music. Uh, so that didn't really hit me like that. Um, not right away. What hit me was, okay, uh, I got to learn. I got to learn this stuff. You know, I, yeah. I got to get like, you know, polish up my stuff. And um, so he calls me. It never made it to Monday. I knew we wouldn't. I told him I was in, blah, blah, blah. He says, okay, let's go get your hair. I was like, go get my hair done. What do you, what do you mean go get my hair done? This hairdresser's name is Alice. Now, uh, Alice was very, very flamboyant. But man, he was the coolest cat, man. So I go in. I'm, now I'm being introduced to a whole different world I ain't never seen before. Mm. And he said, come on in, Prince. You know, it's after hours. And um, we're sitting down, and, and he goes, oh, Lord. He starts picking at my hair like this. He goes, oh, oh. And uh, <laughs> and he says, what are we going to do with this, Prince? What are we going to do? And he, Prince says, I want you to relax it. And I was like, I was like, you going to straighten my hair? He goes, yeah, it'll look cool. You'll like it. And I'm like, man, he didn't even ask. He just telling me what's going to get done, right? <laughs> and so, anyways, hair burning and everything hot. You know what I mean? I had never been, I never had that done. And so I'm freaking out, hair's on fire and Alice rinses it out and it's combing it and doing whatever he does to it. And then he, he grabs the mirror. He turns me around so I could see myself. And I went, Oh my, my <laughs> mom going to kill me. <laughs> All I could think about is that my mom is going to kill me. She don't even know I'm in the band let alone look at my hair. It was like down to here. Cause, so cool. cause, Cause I had a, 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 a curl. It came down, you know, okay. back then we wore a curl, we do a greasy curl. Yeah, yeah. And so once you strip that off, it just lengthens the hair. I mean, it was, I look like a girl. He said, we're going to go to LA tomorrow and do some uh, shopping. I said, man, we going to LA. I mean, just like that. You know, I was like, yeah, man. I said, let's go. And so he says, okay, I'm going to pick you up in the morning. I'll never forget I got out of bed and my hair was just all over the place, like like buckwheat, you know, it was standing cool. straight up just everywhere. I didn't know how to comb it. It was completely straight now. And I walked out of my bedroom. My mother screamed. She thought, <laughs> it was true. She thought a stranger was in the house and she screamed. That's funny. And I said, Mom, it's me. It's me. And she comes running down the hallway. She said, what? What did you do to your hair? And then I told her, I said, hey, I'm playing with this cat named Prince and blah, blah, blah. And I got to go to L.A. He wants me to go to L.A. And she just looked at me. She said, oh, my boy. Oh, my boy. What do you do to your hair? <laughs> so, you know, long story short, we get on a plane. I go to L.A. Yeah. That was my first time being really out of Minnesota. I mean, I've taken little family trips, but I've never been that far away from home. Never been on an airplane before. Mm. And on top of that, I'm walking through the airport, hair looking like, I look like Jimi Hendrix. My hair was just all over the place. And I I just didn't know what to do. And people was looking at me all crazy and stuff. You know, Prince in first class, you know me, I'm back in coach. <laughs> <laughs> it was all good. When we got there, it was a whole nother experience, man. Touching back on what you were saying earlier about Prince standing up to the record label. Did that change things in the industry for other artists? To this day, ain't nothing changed. They doing these 360 deals now. They locking these artists up, give, giving them enough money to where they get excited. But on the back end, you know, you know, and that's why you see people like Taylor Swift, you know, and Kanye and some of these others, Jay-Z, you know, they want to own their masters because like, for instance, I've done, uh, two albums on Motown. I don't have my masters. Mm. I own my publishing. I got all my music back, but I don't own the masters. See, where's my masters? 
So if I wanted to redo those songs, I'd have to go in the studio and totally recreate them. So you don't own your masters. And so I know, and I understand the record companies uh, stand on it too. I mean, this is a business. They in the business, they're taking risks, you know. So, but I understood Prince's argument there. He took a big chance of taking that stand like that. I, I think it kind of hurt him from a fan base it, his fans love him. He got, you know, he got followers that love him to death. Mm -hmm. uh, so it wasn't going to change his fan base. He could still go and play a big arena and sell it out. So it didn't change that. But from a, you know, a record standpoint, you could see he struggled. I would say from sign of the times moving forward, you know, you saw a little decline in his presence on on the major scale with the major labels and with radio you know it changed changed a lot mm. so i don't you know like i said it's just my opinion that's but I, I i think that you know that's what it was about he wrote slave on his face because that's what he felt like he was mm. to an industry that's taking the majority of his money the majority of his earnings when he's the one that did all the work so that's what he felt.